Good morning, everybody. Today we're going to talk about information security concepts, which is kind of a change from what we've been doing, but which is an important part of information technology. We start out with a definition of what secure means, and I like Charles Flieger's definition. A system is secure when it does what it's intended to do and nothing else. The nothing else is the important part. People break into systems by coercing them into doing something they were not intended to do. Like let the bad guys in, for example. Garfinkel and Spafford, who are other computer security researchers, says a computer is secure if you can depend on it and its software to behave as you expect, which really says the same thing. Although I like Flieger's definition better because it uses fewer words. Another researcher, Kurt Sampson, says don't fall into the classic misapprehension error that you're either secure or you're not. The real question is against what sort of attacks am I vulnerable? So that's the thing to be thinking about. We'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about risk management a little bit later today. Security gets specified by policy, and this is something that, uh, that some folks who do security haven't figured out yet. Policies are the organizational laws that tell us what must happen what is allowed to happen, and what must not happen. So I give you an example. I am allowed to see your grades because I am where they came from. The same thing is true of people who work in the registrar's office. The student assistants who work in the IT office are not allowed to see your grades. That's a matter of policy. And so we can say a system, the behavior of which does not violate policy is by definition secure. That is to say policy is the definition of security and that means, and here's the one that trips people up, that means that effective security is impossible in the absence of policy. What happens in the absence of policy is folks make stuff up as they go along and as you know that almost never works. Okay, so every organization then needs that written security policy document. It defines the acceptable behavior, the expected practices, and the responsibilities of the folks using our information technology assets. It makes clear what is protected and why it's protected. And that and why is an important thing. Um, most people want to do well, want to do good, to do the right thing, and they're more likely to do that if you tell them why. If you just say, you must do X, Y, and Z, well, you might get this look, and maybe people think X, Y, and Z are not important. If you tell them why they're important, then they're likely to do what they need to do. That policy articulates security procedures and controls, and we'll talk about the difference between procedures and controls briefly. It tells who is responsible for protecting information, and if there are conflicts, it provides a basis to resolve those conflicts. Policy says what is, what is not allowed, and what may happen, what must happen, what must not happen. In other words, policy defines what security ought to be for an organization or for a system. Controls enforce policies. And so, and I guess an example of a control is who is allowed to see grades by application of, of privileges in a system. So we have that policy that says I can see your grades but the student assistant cannot. Now we apply a control that allows me to see your grades in this class and that does not allow the student assistant to see grades. Application of controls in the absence of policy could be detrimental 
to security. It could make things worse rather than better. There are three properties of information security. I almost guarantee that these are going to be on the final. Let me say it again, I almost guarantee that these are going to be on the final. So is the definition of program counter. Yeah, I get, I get laughter from some of you, but you know what? It's an important thing because it's why von Neumann architecture computers work the way they do. Confidentiality is the first property. It means keeping data and maybe other resources hidden from unauthorized personnel. And we look at that word unauthorized and we might ask ourselves, how do we know who's authorized? And the answer to that is policy. Integrity means something different from the ordinary meaning of the word integrity, unless you mean the ordinary, unless you believe the ordinary meaning is trustworthy. Data integrity means we can trust that data matches the source from which it was derived and has not been changed without proper authorization. Origin integrity means we can trust that information comes from the source that it claims to come from. The third property is availability. Availability means access to data and resources are available when and where they are needed. The slide doesn't say so, but also with suitable response time. If something is slower than molasses, it isn't really very available. The McCumber model is due to or was proposed by a Navy captain by the name of John McCumber. You don't need to remember John's name, but you probably do need to remember McCumber's name, okay? And it says we have these three properties, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But McCumber says we then need to think about three states of information. Information is either in the state of processing, in the state of storage, or in the state of transmission. And then we have controls, and the controls are people, that is procedures, technology, and policy. And I probably ought to rearrange that to put policy first, except that that's not the way Captain McCumber did it. So the point of the McCumber model is to remind us that we need to consider the states of information and the controls that are available while we are thinking about those three properties of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And we need to know what assets we're trying to protect. We need to protect our hardware. If the hardware blows up or is stolen, we're not doing any computing, huh? We need to protect the software for the same reason. We need to protect the data. And this is where many organizations, particularly recently, have fallen down. There have been data breaches. We need to protect the infrastructure. If there is a major fire in the building housing the data center, the data center itself is okay, but the fire marshal won't let you in. That's a problem. And we need infrastructure also includes communications facilities. We need to protect people. The manager who has an indispensable employee has messed up. But you can't work without all of your folks. You've got to have at least some folks around. So several different kinds of assets to be protected. Now, the attackers, the bad guys, also have a triple-barreled set of goals or properties or something. Disclosure compromises confidentiality. Disclosure can be the result of outside attackers, of insiders, or of just plain error, programming or other errors. Alteration compromises integrity. Alteration can be accidental or malicious, or it can come from programming failure or equipment failure. And finally, denial compromises availability. There can be deliberate denial of service attacks, but also failure of systems or of environment. Three different important properties, CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and the 
I guess the other side of each of those, disclosure, alteration, and denial. So who are the attackers? Who are these people who are breaking into computer systems? Intelligence agencies, including U.S. intelligence agencies, sadly enough, criminals, people who want to make money by installing ransomware, for example, misguided or malicious insiders. I once worked at an organization where somebody who thought he was about to be fired sabotaged the payroll program in such a way that if his employee number disappeared, bad things happened to the rest of the data. The good news is we found that and it was a career limiting thing to do for the guy who did it. Career limiting is one of those words you want to, you don't want applied to you, okay? Corporate spies, do, do we believe corporations would spy on each other? Do we believe corporations would spy on you? Um, I came into a little bit of extra money some years ago and decided that I would get uh, one of those easy chairs with the pop-up footstool so I could sit down and relax and read. And I bought one. But ads for that sucker followed me around for about a year. Vandals, people who just want to mess things up. Poorly socialized adolescents. This is the image of the hacker. Um, some guy in his parents' basement with all the lights off and um, his face is green because he's looking at a green screen, right? They're kind of in, in, in the minority when we worry about things like this. And then there might be some other folks. Where are they? Well, outsiders could, could implement network-based attacks. Almost everybody is network connected now, but there can also be physical attacks. Malicious insiders might have authorized access and they might be in positions of trust. The guy who sabotaged the payroll stuff was a programmer, he was in a position of trust. And then there are other insiders who may, might make non-malicious mistakes. Of course I want to delete that file I just told you. Click, oops, right? Non-malicious mistake, but nonetheless, data loss. So, some more vocabulary. A vulnerability is a weakness in a system that could allow it to enter a state not permitted by policy. An exploit this is a noun. Let me say that one again. An exploit is a noun when we're talking about computer security. It is a mechanism for taking advantage of a vulnerability. A threat is a circumstance that could allow the vulnerability to be taken advantage of. So we need all three of those things. The vulnerability, the exploit, and the threat. And if we can get rid of any one of them, we have improved security. Risk is the circumstance that threat and vulnerability exist and exploit, by the way. Um, threat can't exist without the exploit. So risk is the probability of the threat being realized. And if you think about that for just a minute, it, um, risk is an important term in the insurance industry. So my automobile insurer has no idea whether I'm going to be in an automobile accident in 2024. But they know down to four or five decimal places how many male drivers my age driving a car like I drive are going to be in an accident. They know the risk, okay? Back in March of 2020, one of my now former students was afraid that the COVID plague was going to kill everybody. This was by March, we knew that young people were pretty safe. And so I told her she was at greater risk driving on I-75 than she was from COVID, which was probably true. Although maybe not in March of 2020, because there weren't very many people out and about. So we have some goals of information security. We have these three properties, the three attackers triads. Now we have three goals, prevention. We would like to prevent, the slide says attackers, but we'd really like to prevent anyone from violating security policy. Detection, 
if security policy is violated, we'd like to know about it. And one of the things that makes you shake your head when you read the newspaper stories about attacks is, and I, I'm not going to pick on a particular company because I can't remember an example right now, but we read about, oh, Equifax, I'll pick on Equifax. They discover that bad guys have been siphoning off data for the last seven months. <laughs> You'd kind of like to know when something like that is going on sooner than seven months or even seven days. And that's what detection is about. Finally, response and recovery. We want to stop the badness that's going on, whatever it is. We want to repair the damage. We want to continue to function. The hospital where I worked is a kind of high stress environment, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including Christmas and New Year's. And the sick people are still going to be there in their beds, no matter what. So we've got to continue to function, even if an attack succeeds. And once we have cleared away the damage, we'd like to return to a state consistent with policy. The very first big computer that I worked with uh, belonged to the city government of Atlanta, and it was in a room on the ground floor of City Hall. And all the doors were locked. Now, the city was proud of that computer, and there were plate glass windows that let you look in from the outside, but all the doors were locked. I did complain about the windows, and, and they were replaced with glass brick, which is about as tough as regular brick. It, it would be difficult to smash through. We used to be able to secure systems by locking them up. Almost everybody is now connected to a network and through that network to the internet. And from time to time, companies find computers that they thought were not connected to the internet, but only to an internal network. They find out that wasn't the case. Threats can be physically remote. Risk management. And this is, this is one of the things that, <clears throat> that insurance companies do. They would prefer not to insure risky people. So if I had a long history of various traffic offenses, it might be very hard for me to get automobile insurance. Happily for me, I don't have a long history of traffic offenses. But that's risk management. A less obvious example of risk management is that some people pay more for insurance than I do because I have a good record. And I pay more than some other people because I'm 77 years old. And this, yeah, the 77 year old is slowing down. No matter how much I might want to deny it, my reaction time is less than that of anybody else in this room. Y'all are all faster at reacting than I am. Risk identification is the process of examining all of those things that we mentioned at the beginning hardware, software, data, infrastructure, and people, and looking at them in, in light of the current security situation. Once we've done risk identification, now we can start applying controls. Controls reduce risks. Sadly, we can never reduce the risk to zero. One of the things that I was asked while I was working at the hospital is what are your plans in case of a nuclear attack? And I said, you know what? I plan to be dead. Uh, <laughs> there, will be, there will be much bigger problems than whether this hospital's information technology continues to work. They didn't like that, but it's true. Um, you can never get that risk down to zero. Um, for my growing up years, I lived almost within brick chunking distance of Fort Benning. And if the Russians had decided to start lobbing nukes at us, we were going to be first. So I lived with that from, from the time I was a little sprout until I graduated from high school with the idea that you can never re reduce risk to zero. Okay, Infor using information technology creates risk. 
to the CIA confidentiality, integrity, and availability of those assets, hardware, software, data, people, infrastructure. Risks might be direct risk. A direct risk is a risk to the asset itself. An indirect risk is something like business interruption, reputational damage, legal liability. Asset identification is an iterative process. Figure out what our assets are, including all of those elements, people, procedures, data, et cetera, et cetera. And a time to do that is any time you turn on a new information system and any time you decommission one. Assets get classified and categorized, and then we think about the threats to those assets. And I was used to doing that in uh, putting the assets into one of three buckets. We, this organization cannot run without this asset. We're just, we're out of business. Uh, we really need this. Or there's another way of taking care of it and we, we can get around to it when we get around to it. You can do the same thing with threats. Realistic threats need investigation. Unimportant threats can be set aside. And using that nuclear attack threat as an example, threats that you can't do anything about can be set aside too. I cannot do anything if some nation or terrorist group decides to lob a nuclear bomb at Decatur, Georgia. Not a thing I could do about it. Threat assessment means which threats present a danger to our assets, which threats re present the most danger to our information assets, and then how much would it cost to recover? One of the things that one can do in risk management is to simply allow the bad thing to happen and then fix it. Often we do that car tires. My car does not have a spare tire, which is good because it wouldn't fit in the car. It's a tiny little car, right? We're going to allow the risk of a flat tire to happen and we'll deal with it then. Which threats require the greatest expenditure to prevent? And so, then we identify the vulnerabilities, the weaknesses that threat agents could exploit. We examine how each threat might occur and the organizational assets that would be affected. And here's the thing, business schools love this four quadrant chart. This may be the only one in this course, but if you look at the probability of occurrence along the x-axis and the cost or consequence of failure along the y-axis. Those um, risks that have both a high probability and a high cost or consequence, those are the ones you attack first. And then you can attack the ones that have a high cost or consequence and the ones that have a high probability but a lower cost. And after you get all that stuff done in about 150 years, you can attack those in that lower left quadrant that have both a low probability and a low cost. Modern tires are really good. I'm, I'm thinking about tires because I somehow picked up a nail in one of my tires, probably driving to school on Tuesday. Tire worked just fine. Got a little low pressure warning and the folks at the tire company across the street pulled the nail out, put a plug in there, blew the tire back up and I drove back down the road. Probably don't need a spare tire. So what's happening with securities? Vulnerabilities are increasing. We, we had Patch Tuesday last time and um, I can't remember the guy who writes the, uh, the information security blog. But at any rate, he says that Microsoft set a record for patching vulnerabilities this past Tuesday. I'll remember his name just about the time all of you have left the classroom. Why are vulnerabilities up? Software and hardware are more complex than they were a few years ago. I could and did at the time know everything about the MS-DOS operating system. It was sufficiently simple, not that I was smart, but the operating system was sufficiently simple that 
one human brain could hold it all. Nobody knows everything about Windows 11. Incidents are up. The bad guys are out there, they're doing stuff. Losses are up. Virus contamination, data disclosure, hardware theft. The slide, slide doesn't say so, but ransomware is part of virus contamination. Attacks are becoming more sophisticated, but also there is this so-called dark web marketplace of software that's used for the attacks. So the knowledge needed by attackers, as opposed to the ones who develop the software, is decreasing. This is all good news for people who want to work in computer security and bad news for people who already work in computer security. We're going to talk about a principle being a unique entity like a person. A principle might be a computer system, but it's easiest to think of a principle as a person. An identity specifies a principle. So my identity, as far as the KSU systems are concerned, is rbrow211. Have I just given you the key to everything that I can do? No. Could you have found that out by looking at my email address? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's an identity, okay? Authentication is the binding of an identity to an internal representation. In other words, logging on in many cases. Everything, all access, resource allocation, decisions, everything else, assume that binding is correct. So if you knew what my KSU password was, and you had this security key which lives in my pocket, there's another one which lives in my safe deposit box in, in the bank in case I get mugged and lose this one. Uh, knock on wood, I have never been mugged. So authentication is the binding of a principle to a representation of identity. And if you had password and security key, you could do anything I can do. We build systems that first ask for identity, and that's the who are you question. And I might reply, I used to reply B Brown, but somebody else had that one, so now I'm R Brow 211. That won't fit on the slide. Then there is the authentication piece. That's the prove it piece. And I supply a password. My password is not XYZZY, and I hope yours isn't either. If it is, change it, okay? So an identity can be authenticated with one or more factors. Something you know, Here's another list of three things that is likely to appear on the final. Something you know, like a password. Something you have, like that security key I just waved around, or this badge which unlocks doors. Something you are, like your fingerprint, or facial geometry, or retinal characteristics. Multi-factor authentication, sometimes abbreviated MFA, requires two or more of those authenticators. For example, something you know and something you have. So you would have to know my user ID, which is very easy to find out because I just told you. Then you'd have to know my password, which I hope is harder to find out. And you would have to have physical access to this YubiKey. What that means is that if I get mugged and use, lose the YubiKey, or if I'm just careless and lose the UB key, it doesn't do anybody else any good without that password. If my password gets leaked by Microsoft, yes, indeed, Microsoft has access to it because all the stuff we do is really Microsoft Exchange and Office 365. If my password gets leaked, it doesn't do anybody any good without the security key. And that is the point of multi-factor um, authentication and why you all have to struggle with Duo. All right, so what do we use identity for? We use it for access control. I can have access to your grades, but the student assistant cannot. And we use it for accountability. So when I record grades for you, there's a record of who did that. Users 
Um, the exact representation of user is tied to the way a system works, but we can use Unix as an example. Users have a login name that might be rbrow211 or bbrown or something. And then there's a user identification number, which is mapped to that login name internally in Unix. And the Unix kernel uses that UID to identify users. Then there's this concept of groups, people who can do much the same kinds of things. Two different models. The first model is a group is, no, is nothing more than an alias for a collection of principles. Okay, we assign people to groups and they belong there until somebody does something different. The second model, and Microsoft software works this way, principles can change groups. So I can be in more than one group and have different permissions for different things. This is one way to implement something called role-based access control. I, I have a role, in this case, instructor, and I have a set of course sections. In this case, there's only one, and it's you. And with the role instructor, and the collection of course sections, I can do things that instructors are allowed to do. Okay, so we talked about passwords a little bit ago. Passwords are widely used. The system compares the, the password that is typed in that login challenge to something that was saved and either allows access or it doesn't. If the user gets authorized, then the user's privileges are based on that claimed identity. Or to put it another way, if it were not for that security key, if we only did user ID and password, as KSU did a few years ago, anybody who knows my password can do anything I can do. All right, so password sequences of characters, string of letters, 10 digits, um, generated by the user, generated by the computer, uh, depending, okay? Could be sequ sequences of words like open says me, and that's called a passphrase. Could be an algorithm, a challenge in response. So a computer system presents me with a number, and I know that I'm supposed to multiply it by two and add one. That's a something I know. But the number is going to change every time. So you have to not, knowing the number that was used for one login doesn't get you the number for the next one. Okay, storing passwords is problematic. We could store passwords as clear text, and when the password file is compromised, all passwords are revealed. We could encrypt a file, except that the encryption key has to be in memory in order to validate passwords. And so that really reduces to the previous problem of clear text. Encrypting does not help us. The answer is to store a one-way hash of the password. So what gets stored is not the password, but the result of a hash function. And if that file is compromised, the attacker still has to guess the password. Now we can do some automated guessing, and I'm going to tell you how that's prevented in just a minute. Before this mechanism for preventing, the attacker compromises the hashed password file, knows what the hash algorithm is. Kirchhoff's principle is the bad guys know the system. The hash algorithm is known, so the attacker takes a large dictionary and hashes every word. Now, if the hash, if a hash in the password file matches one in the dictionary file, the corresponding word is the password. Oops. If you've heard of rainbow tables, this, is, this isn't that approach. So you foil that by using a random value called a salt, different for each user, that is concatenated with the password before hashing. Picture coming up. The attacker can get the salts if the attacker can get the hash values. We have to assume the attacker can also get the salt because they have to be stored in the same place. But now the attacker has to do a dictionary hash for each salt. That is much more work than just doing it one time. 
So here's the way that works. Storing the password, that is setting up the password, um, the input is a typed password and a generated random value called a salt. The random value gets stored down at the bottom there, but it also goes as part of input to a hash function like bcrypt. The typed password is the rest of the input, and what gets stored is the hash value. Now, when somebody tries to log on, they type their password. The system retrieves the stored salt, runs salt and password through the hash function again, and compares the stored hash to the computed hash. If they are equal, the assumption is that whoever typed the password typed the right password. Is it possible that there could be a hash collision? Yes. But if you use a good enough hash function like bcrypt and a long enough random salt like 128 bits, the possibility of collisions is vanishingly small. Okay, so how strong is a password? We're going to express the strength of a password as bits of entropy. Uh, it's the log base 2 of the number of possible values if and only if the password is selected randomly. If it's not selected randomly, that's not the case anymore. And I'll show you an example of not selected randomly in just a minute. An ATM pin for a bank, four digits, okay? Ten symbols, zero through nine, so about 3.33 and a third bits of entropy per digit. And there are four digits, so 13 and a quarter, 13.28 bits of entropy. But an attacker who's trying to guess that ATM personal identifying number is going to succeed roughly halfway through, or about half the time halfway through. And so it would be 2 to the 128, or about 5,000 tries. And you can get to that same number a different way. There are 10,000 combinations of four digits. 0000 to 9999. And halfway through would be about 5,000 tries. So approaching it either way gives you the same answer. But that's only if the pin is chosen randomly. Now, I mentioned my age a couple of minutes ago. If I used my birth year, y'all could get it in at most three guesses, right? Because I could have been born early in the year, in the middle of the year, or late in the year. Uh, but at most three guesses. Even if someone did not know my exact age, maybe 10 guesses would be enough. So 5,000 guesses if the number is selected randomly, somewhere around three if I use my birth year. Hint, I have not used my birth year, okay? Alphanumeric passwords, letters and numbers. If, that's, if it's case insensitive, there are 26 letters and 10 numbers, so 36 symbols and about 5.17 bits of entropy or randomness in each one. If it's case sensitive, I get 62 symbols, 52 upper and lower case letters, and then the 10 digits. Now I'm at 5.95 bits. Making that password case sensitive increased entropy by less than one bit. That didn't help us very much. An eight character password, 5.95 if it's case sensitive, times eight, 47.6 bits of entropy. And we can do some stuff with that bits of entropy number, which I'll show you in just a second. Okay, I told you I would give you an example of one not selected randomly. There's a link on the slides to the top 500 passwords. The most, the, the slide says worst passwords, but it's really the most used ones. Um, some of them are bad words. Please don't hold that against me. Number one, I didn't make up the passwords, and number two, I didn't even make up that list, okay? If you have one of those, um, you get about nine bits of entropy. Total, nine bits of entropy. So we can subtract one from that nine, 
and 2 to the 8th about 256 searches, about halfway through 500 to guess the password. And yes, indeed, the bad guys have the top 500, the top 10,000, and any other list like that they can lay their hands on. A quarter of a second, if I can do a thousand per second, and I can often do something like a million per second. I wish my mustache did not have a wild hair. I guess I shouldn't be saying that while I'm recording things. I learned long ago not to use bad words in class, but I haven't yet learned not, not to say personal things. So Ross Anderson, who died a week and a half ago, um, he, Anderson was about my age. I did not die a week and a half ago, okay? And, and I'm not gonna die before the final exam, so you gotta study. Anderson's formula says, P is the probability of guessing a password in a specified period of time. G, number of guesses I can test in one time unit. T, number of time units available. N is the number of possible passwords. And that stuff at the end, A with, two, with double bars is the cardinality of the alphabet. So if I have only lowercase letters, the cardinality is 26, there are 26 of them. If I have upper and lowercase letters, the cardinality is 52. If I add in the numbers, the cardinality is 62, raised to the power of the length of the password. So if I have a 62 character alphabet, upper lowercase letters and numbers, and eight characters of password, I would have 62 to the eighth power possible passwords. Log two of that number, n, is the number of bits of entropy. So that's how Anderson says you look at a password. Then you need the probability p to be greater than the time period times the number of guesses per unit of time divided by the number of possible passwords. So here comes an example of that. There are about, depending on whose keyboard you're using, 94 printable characters on the keyboard. If I, if I can guess 10 to the ninth guesses per second, and I want my probability of success to be less than one half, that is 0.5 over a 365 day period, so somebody's going to pound on this 10 to the ninth guesses per second for a year. And I want them to have a probability of less than half of guessing the password. So here's the solution. N has to be greater than or equal to T times G divided by P. Well, 365 days times 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. So now we've got the number of seconds in a year, okay? Times 10 to the ninth guesses per second, and we want a probability of 0.5, so we're gonna divide by P, 0.5, and that comes out, and no, I won't ask you to do this on a test. No, I won't ask you to, do, to remember the formula on a test. That's the kind of stuff you look up if you need it. If you evaluate that, you get 6.31 times 10 to the 16th. I need to choose S, the length of the password, such that the sum from I equals zero to S of 94 to the ith power is greater than or equal to N. And that turns out to be nine, a nine character password, but only if the passwords are selected at random. If we allow some user choice in there, it's gotta be much longer than nine characters. Users make bad choices. One guy did a study, collected 14,000 Windows passwords and uh, tried cracking them and was able to crack a whole lot of them. We can make our systems reject choices that are too short, but users might pick guessable passwords. So crackers use lists of, of passwords, of likely passwords. Many, many years ago, I needed to break into the computer of one of my coworkers and she was on an airplane headed for the other side of the country. And this is in the days before there were phones on airplanes. 
the password was not her husband's name, her child's name. I got it on the second dog. Don't do that. Now, it's a good thing I was able to break into Tracy's computer because I needed something that was in there. But don't do that, okay? 14,000 encrypted passwords. The security researcher was able to guess nearly a quarter of them. It would take about an hour on the fastest computer systems to compute all of the variants of 14,000. And I only need one if I'm going to break in. Users pick easy to guess passwords. They pick dictionary words or they try to reverse a dictionary word or mess around with capitalizations or substitute numbers or use conjugations or declensions or bad words. Those are all in the dictionaries the bad guys use. Digits only, letters only, way too short. License plate numbers. No, my password is not my license plate number. Personal characteristics like the second dog or the kid's names or the date of a wedding. We can maybe try to analyze passwords for goodness. And there's a, there's a Password Plus program that tries to do that. It can detect bad passwords if we have a list, a definition of bad, like the 10,000 most often used passwords. I can discriminate per user or per site. That is, I can uh, decide that the registrar's password has to be better, of better quality than Bob Brown's password because breaking into the registrar's account has more serious consequences. I need to be able to do pattern matching. I need to be able to execute sub-programs like a spell checker. And uh, such programs exist and they're pretty easy to set up. I'm not sure they're good for very much. Then there is forced compliance. Your password must be eight characters, have at least one capital letter, one small letter, one digit, and one punctuation mark. <laughs> Guess what? That is less secure than a random password from the 94 characters on the keyboard. Random password, about 6.5 bits of entropy, so 52.4 bits for an eight-character password. One capital letter, that's one out of 26. 4.7 bits, one small letter, another 4.7. One digit, 3.32. And one punctuation, 5.05. .05. And four unrestricted, 43.97 bits. That password is less secure than a randomly generated one. Over the randomly generated one is more than 256 times more difficult to force. And then there's forcing people to change passwords. KSU does that. I don't like it. I don't think it's good for anything. The time you need to change your password is when it has been compromised. If it hasn't been compromised, there's no point in changing it. And if it has been, you need to change it right now, not next year. But if you're going to do that, give people time to think of good passwords. Don't force them to change before they can log in. Usually if I'm logging into a system, it's because I need to do something. Well, you got to change your password before you can do whatever it is you have to do. Okay, X, Y, Z, Z, Y. That is matrix, uh, matrix multiplication mnemonic, X, Y, Z, Z, Y. Warn them a long time in advance so they have a chance to get ready. Okay. Another way to do that is the one-time password used exactly once and invalidated when done. A challenge response mechanism, and I mentioned that, where the challenge is a number and I have to do a computation on it. There, there could be problems of synchronization, problems of generating good random passwords, and problems of distributing those good random passwords. I like my security key. Hardware support, we can use a token-based gadget like that key that I've been waving around. It might do a computation or encipher or hash a challenge and might or might not require input from the user. We can have a magnetic card. Those are easy to forge. A memory card 
or a smart card. The smart card differs from the memory card in that it has some processing capability. Or temporal-based passwords. Every roughly minute or so, a different number shows up. The computer knows what number to expect at a given time and knows what number just expired and what one is coming next. So if the clocks are not quite synchronized, things still work. So users enter that number and a fixed password. The memory card stores data but doesn't do any processing. A bank stripe card stores data. An electronic memory card also stores data, but it stores it in, uh, in a chip rather than on a, uh, on a magnetic stripe. Those can be used alone for physical access. I wave my card next to the door, and if I'm allowed in, the door unlocks. If I'm not allowed in, the door doesn't unlock. Could be used with a password or PIN. If you look around this building, you will find card readers with keypads. We used to use a, a pin in addition to the card so that if I dropped my card in the parking lot, which I don't do but other people have done, whoever found it would not be able to get in the door without also knowing that pin. Drawbacks, I need readers, I, losing the card is a problem, and having to have the card is a problem. I solved it by wrapping it around my neck. Other people solve it in other ways. A smart card looks like this. There is the, the lines around the outside edges are a proximity antenna. Then there's some contacts, and you can see those on a credit card if you look at it. And an embedded processor that has a CPU, RAM, read-only memory, and a cryptographic processor, all embedded in that little bitty card can be wired access through the contacts or wireless through that proximity antenna, might have that crypto coprocessor, and does have read-only memory, programmable memory, and RAM memory, and executes some protocol to talk back and forth to the reader or computer. How are we doing? Okay. Biometric authentication, not with my retina, you don't. Biometric authentication based on one of their physical characteristics. Remember something you know, something you have, something you are. Fingerprint and facial geometry are the most common. And I say facial geometry because facial recognition works by identifying key points on your face and the distances between those key points. It isn't really recognizing the face in the sense that we think of it. Hand geometry also works. Retina scans and iris scans also work, although I and many others are resistant to retina scans and iris scans. I don't want a laser poking into my eye. Static and dynamic signature recognition. Your, your signature is never twice alike, but the pattern of pressure is very similar every time. Multiple tries for, say, registering a fingerprint never get identical templates, so I have problems of false match and false non-match, and we can see that there is, on the graph, I got two bell curves that overlap. False positives where the imposter is falsely identified as the authorized user, and false negatives where the authorized user can't get in. I hate it when something says fingerprint not matched. It's the same fingerprint you saw last time. Give me a break. So there are some problems with that. We assume the biometric device is accurate in the environment in which it is used. Want to use fingerprint readers in a bakery? Mm -mm. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. It assumes transmission is both tamper-proof and correct. So if I'm using a fingerprint reader on a phone, the transmission is all internal to the phone. But if I have a fingerprint reader out in the hall, that's going to let me into a door. There's transmission back to a computer somewhere. 
There are some other problems. One of them is acceptance. Another is cost. Um, normal variability. My fingerprint is different if I've been washing dishes than it is when I've been standing in the classroom for a while. It could be a single point of failure. Sometimes you have the option of instead of using your fingerprint or your face, you can swipe and type in a, a PIN number or some other passcode. Um, recognition speed, that, that's largely solved by Moore's Law. Possibility of forgery. Everybody has heard the, the apocryphal tale of the mafiosi who cut off the finger to take it where the fingerprint reader was. Folks have done some pretty good, good forgeries of facial recognition scans. Something you need to think about is that there are two different questions when we talk about biometry, identification or authentication. Authentication asks, does this fingerprint belong to John Doe? Identification says, to whom does this fingerprint belong? And they are very different questions. And one of them is a lot harder than the other one. Okay, it is not uncommon for system designers to conflate, confuse, mess up identification and authentication. Social security number. Social security number is a dandy identifier. The Social Security Administration has issued duplicate, incorrect, incorrectly issued duplicate social security numbers, but not very often. And they have a mechanism looking at names and whatnot to check for that. The social security number is a pretty good identifier. Is it a good authenticator? Does the fact that I know my social security number mean that I am me? All right, if I were not recording this, I would tell you what my social security number was because it's a miserable authenticator. I'm not really ready to put it in a recording, okay? What is anybody thinking of? Uncle, don't do that. All right, and then there is knowledge-based authentication. And you find that when you try to do my credit report or when you try to do something with the Internal Revenue Service. Knowledge-based authentication is a thoroughly bogus idea. Bogus, as the guys on Car Talk would have said. The, the premise, the belief, is that oh, you're the only one who's going to know things like your former address, your mother's maiden name your social security number. All of those things can be researched. If you could get at my credit record, which you probably can if you work at it hard enough, it's not interesting, you don't need to do it. You'll find my former addresses there. You'll find my social security number. Um, if you could get into ancestry.com, which you probably can, it's not hard, you'll find my mother's maiden name. All of that stuff is researchable. And that means that none of it is good for authenticating. Authenticators should never be researchable. All right, so one last thing, and, and we'll finish once again early, but not hideously early. I, I want to mention this thing called a pass key, and we're going to talk about how they work next time. But we have to have to discuss public key encryption before we can talk about how pass keys work. A pass key is a credential stored on a, a device like a phone that encodes an identity like a user ID and a private cryptographic key. The credential is stored on the device, it's, it's bits in your phone, and it's protected by the access protection for the device. Now, listen up, protected by the access protection for the device. If you have a habit of leaving your phone on the counter at the bar when you leave the bar late at night and your unlock code is 1234, pass keys are not for you. About every five years, some Apple employee leaves a, a prototype iPhone in a bar. I think they must be doing this on purpose since it's happened more than a couple of times. 
enrollment, that is account creation, stores the identity token and the public key, the corresponding public key, gets stored on the, on the server you are enrolling. So if I were using a pass key for my bank, which I don't, stored on my device would be my user ID and the private key, and stored in the bank's computer would be the user ID and the corresponding public key. Now, the bank can send me a message. I encrypt it with my private key. They decrypt it with my public key and verify that I have my phone in my hand. No, they verify that someone has my phone in my hand. Oops. We'll talk about this and how it works next time, but be suspicious of pass keys. And if you decide to use pass keys, and there's some good reasons you might want to, if you decide to use pass keys, all your eggs are in that one basket that is your phone. An important thing to know, and they don't tell you that. They don't tell you that. All right, so we came, <laughs> we almost used 75 minutes. We used 65 minutes. Anybody have any questions? All right, thank you very much, gentlemen and lady. Have a good afternoon. Don't get too wet out there. Actually, it looks like it stopped raining, but it's gonna be miserable tonight. Have a nice weekend, and I'll see you on Tuesday when we talk about encryption.